go ahead and get started here. Um, so Victor's our, our last presentation of the afternoon in this track, and then we've got the closing keynote next door. I saw Joe stared at outside, so he's in the house, uh, if you will. But uh, Victor's going to be talking about, if you will, mastering in memory. It's I don't know how much you guys are seeing it out in the company in your fields, at least in my world, the uh, advisory services world. We've got in memory at every single client these days. And some of the stuff we've talked about with logical data warehouses, virtualizations, uh, we've also seen some of this caching layer in memory databases that make so many of all these other workarounds we've had for years just go away. So uh, we're a big fan. And I actually know that Radiant Advisors, my company, is got a briefing with Hazelcast coming up in the next few weeks to make sure we're up to date with their products as well. Um, and we cover everybody in the space with you. So with that, I will turn it over to you. It's a 45 minute presentation and then we have a closing keynote next door. Of course, the big raffle. I've been told to say that a number of times. Beats, headphones, things like that must be present tonight. So that was Mary D. All right, Victor, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you. Oh, guys, can you hear me well? Uh, everything's all right, right? Can you see slides well? Just to check. All right, cool. So um, I'll try. To, usually, when I do the talks, and I'm trying to understand why the people here. So that's why I just uh, you know quick show the hands. Uh, I know like some people hate this, but you know it, it gives me better understanding how how to position presentation uh, in, in a better way. So so do we have any architects in the room? Like who interested in low latency projects, or they they working on low latency project? Anyone? Any architects? Okay, so one. Um, anyone who interested in NoSQL solutions and just learning about different technologies out there? Anyone? Any practitioners? All right. Um, how many of you heard about the uh, in-memory data grids before this presentation on in, in general? Have you, how many of you heard about this term? Okay, have one group? Well, yeah, nice. Okay, cool. Some people, because sometimes people don't know what the hell is this, and I still will explain for the rest of the people, don't worry. Um, so you will be in good shape. Uh, do we have any developers, like the people who actually have their hands dirty? Oh, nice. I love this crowd. I usually talk to developers in a different uh, outfit, in the t-shirt. But, uh, yeah. All right. And uh, any data enthusiasts, like people who love the data science and some sort of like research and stuff like that? Yeah, we see, I see it. We have uh, two people here. Cool. All right. So, two, just a little bit about myself. So I work as a senior solutions architect of a company called Hazelcast. So we work on the open source space. We have this uh, open source product that in the field of a memory data grid, and I will explain what does it mean. Um, and because I work as a solutions architect, I can consider myself as a practitioner because I work with the customers, and I'm just not the person who, you know, designing checks or like you know, getting the checks. I'm actually the person who feel the pain of the customers. I'm here on the front line of our customer support and um, I work on the pre-sales and the post-sales position, so I know different uh, the verticals of the business where in-memory technologies are using right now. Now, also, as I mentioned, I also work, because we're an open source company, I work with the developers, and our target audience is, make, uh, is developers, so we're trying to make them productive with in-memory technologies to reduce friction, to reduce all this like uh, fear and certainty down the skills, so that's why I work closely in, in this field, um, also, on Twitter. How many of you guys have a Twitter? Okay, so we have one person, two person. How many of you guys have an email? <laughs> All right. For those of you who don't have a Twitter, I have an email. For those of you who have a Twitter, you can go ahead and follow me. Um, I'm tweeting very interesting stuff. Okay. So enough about me. So let's talk about a little quickly how I uh, uh, divide my presentation today and how it's going to be organized. So the very beginning, I will explain the in-memory technology landscape and how we position against different, or not against, but together with other solutions in the world that you already know, like databases, messaging systems, etc. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what's the main applications for, for distributed data, for distributed technologies, for distributed in-memory data. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, new ways or like a paradigm shift on uh, scalability and durability of your data. Uh, even though it's in memory, there are some ways how you can preserve it without you know, explicitly putting it on the disk, which is one of the options, but it's not the, the only one. Plus, we will have a session, a QA session, where you can ask your questions, and hopefully, I'll give you answers. This is the uh, kind of idea. All right, 
So what is the current problem with a memory day, right? So typically, I'm going from the small, small kind of picture. We're starting with one application. Uh, it can be any type of application. It can be a web application that uh, runs the website, or it can be some back office application that runs some of the processing. And the typical, like when we're talking about like Java application or any application in general, uh, there are certain uh, levels of uh, abstraction that allow you to move uh, back and forth in terms of speed versus uh, latency. So when you go into closer to the disk, um, and uh, disks give or network gives us like a very um, the low level of uh, communication or data transfer speed comparing to the in-memory technologies. And when, because we have a memory very close to our, uh, the processor, so the memory uh, access time is, is much, much, much faster than accessing some data over network or even on the disk. Now, if we're going from the, the, the smaller picture to the bigger picture in the organizations, we have multiple different um, applications and there's multiple ways how um, this problem becomes even bigger when we're introducing any other aspects. So some of the applications can communicate to each other directly or indirectly. Um, and uh, in, today's, in today's world, in 2017, uh, we're also facing the, the, the problem called microservices and some, some, some Somehow people decide, okay, so we, we were writing our application in monolithic type of fashion. Now we want to have a microservice because we want to divide responsibility. We want to divide the ways how we manage the teams. And as many of you know, that the, the, the microservices or like uh, not only microservices, uh, the application uh, architecture usually uh, reflects the organizational structure. Like if your organization was like big. Um, monolithic type of application, you stick to the monolithic organization uh, of applications. Uh, because we're going into the more agile and modern uh, way how we organize the teams, microservices become more uh, and more uh, popular to implement certain, certain applications and business tasks. Now, from that perspective, um, there are certain challenges that developers are usually um, facing with. Uh, starting with uh, the platform itself, I'm talking about Java, but in general many other platforms have similar, uh, similar um, constraints or limitations, something like that. So Java itself, it's just a, a, a virtual machine that has constraints from perspective of resources, isolation from uh, getting outside or like acquiring more memory if it was limited well, you know, during the startup. Um, we're running this application in actual hardware, so we need to think about what kind of limitations uh, we usually put into the system. There's a very interesting term called a mechanical sympathy, which, uh, how many of you have heard about this one? Anyone? So the mechanical sympathy is the idea that uh, the very popular racer in, I guess, in the 70s, uh, um, uh, J.K. Robinson, uh, had in mind, and he said, like, when the racer has this idea how the thing works underneath, he can do the better decisions on the way how the machine runs. And from perspective of developers, we as developers, architects, and uh, people who are actually dealing with data, we also need, need to understand this like a mechanical sympathy and understand from perspective of, uh, understand performance from perspective of hardware. Not only software, but also from perspective of the hardware. We need to think like what uh, boundaries in our, um, the, uh, CPU, uh, how the caches inside the CPU work better, uh, if we will opti we'll run this optimized version of our code, how we can op write optimized version of the code, etc. So many things we need to think about. And when we go in like higher and higher, when we bring more and more complex things, um, the things are getting like more and more complex, complex and more messy. Network, databases, and we need to deal with all this stuff. And we need to think about this. And we need to know about this. It's, there's no like way how we can avoid this problem. because. If we're gonna hide from this problem, they, they, they're not make them disappear. So these kind of things needs to be taken into account while uh, we design and develop the systems. Now, the things get even more interesting. Now we're talking about services. We're talking about different types of clients. Uh, not only desktop clients, but also mobile clients and different technology that are available, and iPhone, Android, etc. And now we're thinking not from perspective for applications, we're thinking from a perspective, from a perspective of um, services. Different, different uh, services can interact with each other. We're using some universal solution potentially. 
And the, 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 the one of the things that I want to point out here that the thing that in memory technology and memory grids um, that uh, available these days that help to drive this. So this is kind of my idea and uh, the things that I want to talk today, right? So let's focus on this, what actually, you know, where we stand with in memory data grid. So from this picture, we can kind of understand that it's in the middle, right? If it's in the middle, it's middleware. So it's as simple as that. So basically, it is data, uh, data support middleware. And as a middleware, we also know as every project has database. Every project has some sort of uh, SQL store because SQL store here for already like over 25 years, different products there, here and there, SQL, people know SQL. So that's why it's the biggest thing in this slide, right? So the, I'm trying to create this like um, scale so you understand how these things are fit together. Now, because we need to interchange some, um, um, some data between applications, typical enterprise applications usually include messaging system because messaging system allows the system to communicate asynchronously. So one system will not directly connect it, uh, to another system. So in this case, with the failure of one system will not lead to failure to another system. So some of the uh, messaging system provides the ways how you can persist this data in traditional uh, uh, SQL database. You can have an integration and have a persistence there. So that's why there is an inter... Um, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? Um, intersection. Intersection, exactly. Perfect. So, now, uh, we start dealing with large amounts of data already for quite some time. And to, to effectively process this data, we need to bring some, some tools that allow us to run this distributed computation. Uh, Adobe is a good example that changed the way how we're dealing with large data. We, uh, we run in this batch uh, jobs every night and in distributed fashion in the uh, MapReduce paradigm, which allows us to think about a little bit different from the perspective of the data um, as, a, as a source for the data. It can be SQL data or it can be something else, uh, NoSQL. I'll uh, bring the NoSQL in the picture in a moment. And uh, some of the messages might arrive, so you might think uh, uh, on, about the processing in the fashion of like stream processing type of thing. And of course, no SQL database. And uh, these days, uh, the people are switching to use the distributed uh, in, uh, no SQL database that, because they allow them to be more agile, uh, more scalable, and allow them to do more things without um, changing lots of things without uh, overthinking uh, schema and all these boundaries. And from perspective of this, I think uh, we position in memory data grids in the middle of this, in the intersection of all, all these areas. So in memory grids, they provide the ways how we can store the data, um, provide the ways how it's stored in no simple fashion. So the key value store, very simple, very easy. You don't need to think about the schema. Your data describes your schema. Now, uh, because the data already inside your grid, it will be wasteful to move this around. So the grid itself is a network of computers, network of uh, nodes, and you have the data in place. So to move data around to do some computation will be wasteful resources. So computational part also included here in the messaging, uh, in, the, in the memory grid. And the uh, messaging component, since these nodes are interconnected, so they can exchange messages, send messages to each other, providing uh, familiar abstracts like Q topic, ring buffers, etc. Um, plus, we can't avoid uh, comparison or we can avoid the ways how question about the SQL. Like how I can query no SQL database? How I can query key value store? Well, we need to write this name to map reduce, but it's easy, right? Let's write it. So, no, people want to use known tools, uh, people want to use the ways how they can query. So, in uh, many in memory grids that are, are, are there, they have SQL queries capabilities that allow people to stay in a familiar world, I would say, without thinking or thinking this problem much. So, because of the things that I explained from perspective of latency and uh, perspective of the memory and how the, the when we have everything in memory, not in the disk. Um, it actually creates very interesting business use cases for, for the systems like in memory grids or in memory databases. But if you can think, like sometimes people ask, okay, so what's the difference between memory database and memory grid, right? 
you already know this answer from the previous slide because in memory database it's just only storage. Grid provides you more capabilities including computing, messaging, um, and etc. The database you can you can model your your messaging system out of the database, but it's still kind of you need to support this custom solution. Now, from perspective of business, again, uh, real time processing, real time data um, uh, data analysis, um, fraud detection, um, real time inventory checks. These are some of the examples where the memory data grids used today. Uh, it's not like something that uh, the people are pure seeing or like the, the thinking about this. The people use the grids right now in production. Uh, the largest grid, uh, like for example, from Hazelcast perspective, right now runs in some band in Europe, uh, size of 600 nodes. Uh, 600 nodes, it's a cluster that uh, divided by three physical distributed data centers with over, um, and they're using this for, for real time risk management, fraud detection. The tasks, the business tasks that require immediate reaction and very low latency. So there's just, a, just a, um, some of the verticals <coughs> where we are using today. So we have uh, from perspective of a solution architect, I, can, I, I deal with uh, financial companies, I deal with the retail companies. Uh, right now we, we develop some of the use cases for, for medical industry where uh, the grid can be used for fast access storage and uh, distributed computation platform that allows process streams of data that come in from different uh, devices that collect uh, information like heart rate, um, some blood pressure, etc. So what are the trends or like what drivers of the memory tech? Why it is today, why it is um, why it's so popular today, or maybe if it's not popular, why it will be popular next year, or like it's not gonna be um, gonna be the next thing. So from perspective of hardware, so many uh, from perspective of the hardware plus software, right? Because it's also related to the processors. Now we have a 64-bit uh, 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 processors. Uh, and our operation systems run on 64-bit that allows them to address more memory than in 32-bit uh, uh, processors, right? So we can address tremendous amount of memory, so applications will be able to see all this memory. Um, number of cores, so now we know that we cannot, the, the, the designers and the manufacturers of our processors, they cannot increase uh, the CPU speed. We cannot increase like clock speed, right? It, we cannot run for my gigahertz. This is gigahertz. This is uh, stuff. We increase in cores. That creates more new use cases for massive parallel computing, um, and the prices of these processors go down, where the power of the processors goes up. So in this graph, uh, you see this typical uh, configuration that you can find in one of your data centers when you have a. 12 cores, 24 cores machines, and it's it's already it's already things are in production. Um, so speed uh, and the price of memory uh, significantly <coughs> decreased over the last uh, 15 years. From this chart, you can see that uh, there's forecast that the uh, price for for a gigabyte of RAM of RAM is going to be just a fraction of cents very soon. So even right now, cloud providers like Azure or um, Amazon, they provide you with uh, machines with a terabyte of RAM. Just one single machine has a one terabyte of RAM. So what you can do with this, if it's like highly scalable, you can have greed of that kind of machine. You don't need to store it on the disk because it's going to be slower and the memory you can access is very fast. And speaking about speed, another aspect of the speed, because we're talking about the grid, grid itself is the network bound component. So it's related to the network speed. Since we, um, since uh, the gigabyte is on Ethernet, or like a 100 megabits is on that time, I remember when I was in university, um, it still was wow, it's super fast. it was like fast, 100 megabit. Um, Internet. Now, right now, it's like we're talking about hundreds of gigabits. So, having this network also reduces boundaries of, of latency. So, data moves with very, very fast. I'm not saying like lightning fast because it, it, 
did we go to, to the talk of physics where we cannot beat the speed of light, but we still, it's still pretty fast. Well, so what are the applications these days? So we talk about business use cases, we talk about the drivers, uh, hardware drivers, sort of thing. So how do people use grids these days, or how do people use in memory technology? Well, so there's actually kind of free, not the limited the number of use cases, but I, I, what I found uh, when I talk to the people, it's easy to stick to the number of items that people can count on their hand. But actually, the use cases is in the different applications is, is even more. Even myself, I cannot name all of them because every day I have a, a call with customer where they come up with some new idea how this grid system can be used. And we need to help them to, uh, to wrap their heads around and our heads around to see if it's good or bad. So typical uh, scenario, um, I guess I can say like 85% of cases where I deal with customers, how they use a memory grid is uh, distributed cache. Easy to understand, easy to start with, easy to, um, to, to convince your manager that um, this helps to speed up certain aspects of the application. The caching application, caching, uh, this, uh, session replication, this kind of thing. The distributed computing. Now it is time where one machine cannot process everything. So we have so much data that we can just divide and conquer instead of just run this in one node. There are some algorithms that would be very good on um, single mode processing, like a word count, right? So we have a word count scenario, uh, we have a utility that called WC that counts number. It's not super distributed task. But MapReduce job uh, that can run this distributed task of counting words um, with thousands or millions of thousands um, sources, it's kind of interesting. Plus, uh, when I mentioned about different ways how the people interact into the systems, the request response failed because it's not reactive anymore. Data changes much faster than you actually think that you need. So that's why the data on the clients need to be updated in the sense, in the same time when it actually arrived in the system. So um, uh, remember these uh, use cases of uh, situation management, like uh, fraud detection, risk management. All these things require immediate attention of, uh, of the personnel, of the people, so they need to have a decision right away, not the requesting and waiting and stuff like that. So cache to service, pretty easy to, um, to wrap around. There is some system that requires some fast data because it will take some time to, pro to, to recalculate the data for each request. Or it, maybe it runs overnight uh, uh, a loop or spark job. This result needs to be accessed for application very quickly. Uh, and it's not only a matter of one application uses the data, but many applications can use this data. Instead of recalculating this data over and over, just use it from the cache. Uh, another good example is a retail store or like, um, like Amazon. You go into Amazon, you're putting some stuff in your uh, store, uh, store card, and um, this is how the user sees it, but how engineer sees it, you have a uh, web server, you have a load balancer on the front, and the user will go through the load balancer, and uh, your code will be executed on this application server. And the, the, the card items will be stored in each TP session on the server side. But what happens if the server goes down? Your load balancer will redirect your user to another application server, and it will, over, it will run this code again. But what user will see, because the data that he used, the, the things that he put into um, into shopping cart, this data already disappeared, so user will see empty carts. It's a pretty bad user experience. So in this case, the, the scenario of uh, session replication, it's very viable, <coughs> and uh, it's, a, it's another, I guess, like 10% of use cases how the people use using Greece right now. Because they can focus on the things that uh, provide awesome user experience, the, uh, nice web design, and the integration with uh, fast uh, shipping uh, provider, so they, they, they can get money faster from the user, and uh, sort of delegate this task of handling this low-level stuff to the technologies like the memory grid. Plus, um, cloud, 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 cloud. Everything goes into the cloud. It allows people and it allows businesses to decrease the, the expenses for, for um, for hardware, uh, better utilization of resources, and uh, getting like 
quote billing. They, they will pay for stuff that they actually use. And elastic scalability allows to uh, increase the storage, allows to increase number of uh, application instances that can handle load. This is kind of a very good thing, and it's used in production of many, many companies today. Um, but if, like, Elastic scalability could not in the sense of you know scaling up, but also scaling down. That allows you to increase number of nodes that you actually use, because there's no you know there's no user load at this point right now, so you don't need to pay more. This is a very good thing, a very good quality of in-memory grid that allows you scale up and scale down. Uh, applicable today in the, in the, in the, in, mem uh, in the cloud computing space. Uh, plus, uh, supporting developers in uh, in uh, their way how they want to deploy their applications, deploy it to um, the Elastic uh, Cloud Computing Service, or deploying on local premises with uh, the containers, stuff like that. So they want to have it, and they have it from uh, from the vendors of the grids. So it is it is it is today. It is not something that they want, and then will happen. Tomorrow, it's already today, and the people are using one of the retailers, like larger retailers, um, say like department stores. I don't want to name a brand, uh, but I'm pretty sure everyone in this room have bought something. They use in memory grid for um, for real time inventory management and uh, storefront cache. So they, they some of the details that they display on the website. Um, and some of the details that they integrate with some, like backend services, logistics, logistics and uh, the inventory management systems built on top of the memory technologies because of the uh, quality that I started. Plus, they deploy it with, uh, with a Docker, they deploy it in, uh, in the containers. So, database caching. Database caching allows not only to provide the faster access to the slow data, so you already fixed everything, you optimized your indexes, you could try everything, but still your query is taking slower because not because of the um, because of the software, but because of amount of data. So the caching, breathing caching layer into the picture allows to optimize this load and surface data faster. Um, it's not only related to the databases; it's related to um, if your application depends on some external services, like you querying some of the data from from another web service. And the caching is response because you don't need this often, but you want you want to have this response faster. So, for example, you you need to um, based on the information about the weather that you came from another external service, you need to plan your logistics like your transportation per day. So you need to query this service once a day. You don't need to like query this often, but you can run this and have this data in, in the cache, and other systems can use it reuse it from the cache. And um, I already talk about elastic scalability, but I want to uh, demonstrate this picture. What it means that from perspective of a user, from perspective of developer of this stuff, uh, they looks like the monolith thing, but internally systems like the memory grids, they're providing the ways how this stuff can be scaled, how this stuff can be also successfully uh, back up to the data model. So in case of failure, data that we have here, will be stored here. So we're not losing data and the same stuff this piece of data will be available on the backup on another node. <coughs> microservices. Different ways how the, the grid can help in the microservices way. When we talk about microservices, we're talking about one service that will serve one business task and this service needs to make it good, make it awesome. But no one is actually saying that this service needs to be just the one node because it's just a microservice. From perspective of business, it's microservice. But from perspective of, um, uh, of of technology, it needs to scale. If the service needs to serve many requests, and uh, the grid fits very well here. Today, uh, the organizations, different companies, uh, IT IT departments, they actually don't need to or they don't want to stick to one particular technology like Java or they want to because they want to find the talents in the all different uh, areas they want to find them in, in the C++ world they wanna, because maybe there's some um, uh, the very like, embedded technology that needs to interact with the grid or need to interact in general 
Uh, there are many talent right now in the JavaScript world, so they don't want to just give up on these people or not hire these people just because they are JavaScript. So it's, it's not the paradigm anymore. So there is a polyglot uh, movement in organizations. And microservices actually allow to do that because you want to deploy one service using one language and you don't care because there is a, a, the common interface, common, uh, common way how they can interact, how the data can move from one application to another. So for example, I have this, um, um, I have this uh, customer, what they use, um, they run some of the, uh, the processing using Spark, they uh, dump the results um, in, uh, in uh, data grid, like namely Hazelcast, and they use .NET client to have uh, the Excel, <laughs> Excel client to connect this and bring some data to, to Excel shit, and they have no GS application that actually visualizes on the, on the front page on, uh, on their website. So it's not, it's not about what kind of language the system is written these days. So it's all about how the developers can be productive. So there's like a fi um, finite version of the microservices, of microservice that might be written in, in Python or C++. But for scalability of the service, uh, the system like uh, Hazelcast or some other things, some other systems can be used to scale this um, at large. And when we talk about clients, so the um, clients from this perspective is the consumer of the data. Clients, this, this is your microservice, this is your uh, business thing, this is your, um, this is your business logic, if you say. And this business logic needs to get the data as soon as changed from another node, because now we're in the distributed world, now we're in the clustered world, and now we need to um, get this data faster and faster. So, ex uh, you, keep, you don't want to change your client configuration, your application configuration, if you just need to add one more node. You need to have this dynamic, remember this elastic scalability. We need to have ability to scale the system that um, accordingly to demand. So clients need to be reactive. And uh, as I mentioned, language is not the boundary anymore. Um, uh, the different languages, different platforms, so for example, uh, Java, Clojure, they, for example, in Scala, they own JVM, but C++ is a totally different story. Python, it's, it's a absolutely a different story. There's no like threads in Python, right? It's, it's an interpreted, uh, uh, interpreted language. Uh, not just same with Node.js, but we still have lots of libraries, so developers have lots of libraries that they can use to write these microservices to interchange with each other components of the system. Now, I talk about a little more about um, about the data, face data, but you know, bad things tend to happen. So, what, how are we going to deal with the failures? How are we going to do? Um, how are we going to deal with the the, the uh, auditors and network partition, etc.? Typical um, typical use case or typical solution. Okay, so let's let's use persistent storage. We use databases, we use some uh, enterprise information systems, the way we can receive the data. Um, we can store it in files and etc. But I have another option. Like, <laughs> I want to store everything, even my backups in memory. But it also would be cool. And you can say, what? How, how, it's, how, it's, how it's reliable? How it's, uh, how it's uh, safe? Yeah, I will, I'll keep this slide for a moment so you, you can take a picture. All right. So, so let's, let me talk a little quickly about the data distribution. <coughs> two types of data distribution in distributed systems, systems are typically, or two, two patterns of data distribution are very typical here. It's replication, where you have copy of the same data across all your members. For uh, obvious reasons, your um, replication thing doesn't scale well because it's limited by the size or the capacity of the smallest node. So this why people say, okay, so now we, can, we cannot replicate, so let us think about how we can deal with data. So we don't need to maybe all the data on the whole node, so we can share this data, we can partition this data and uh, spread this data across multiple nodes. So in this case, the one node will have just a subset of the data, another one, another subset, etc., etc. So you can scale this. But it's also not not very good uh, approach because you can think, okay, so how are we gonna, how are we gonna deal with um, redundancy in failure, if one of the nodes will go down, it doesn't help me in terms of, uh, yeah, I, I solved the problem with scalability. Now, how I can deal with data safety? 
Uh, yeah. I stood here as just a you know check that you you still still with me. You're not sleeping. Um, yeah, we're good, right? Because it's going to be some important points here. All right. So I'm going to talk about the way how the data partition and the, the, the concept of consistent hashing. So consistent hashing is an idea that allows, basically this idea came from, 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 from design of uh, data structures like a hash map, right? So you use a key to figure out where the data will be placed in terms of like, uh, internal bucket systems, etc. But in the same world, this also can be applicable. Uh, so we have one node that will have all this data uh, stored in limited number of partitions. So partitions are going to be like uh, things that store your data, that move around, so your data doesn't exist by itself. Now, we're using this uh, sharding technology to spread the data across partitions. But we also can combine it with replication techniques to create the memory backups because while we scale, we're adding more, um, more shared memory to the system, but we're also creating some additional memory that we can use for doing something useful. In particular, we can use it for storing the backup. So now one node will have primary partition of primary partitions and some backup partitions from another node. So in case of failure, we will return to the state where um, data is still there. And actually, this concept is scales very well. So it, it includes um, it includes uh, the both, both of this world of uh, sharding and uh, replication. Now, the, how, the way how it works, clients, the consumer of the data, and uh, the storage nodes, they have agreement. They know how they're going to deal with data. And they use this like unified way to identify where data is based on the key. We pass in the key, we create the hash function that will place the data in a particular node. So now I will demonstrate to you how it works in a nutshell um, in, in terms of like we, how the elastic uh, scalability works and how, how we can um, preserve the data if, in case of node failure. So for example, we have three nodes, data is distributed according to this rule. Um, we have some of the partitions that stored in, uh, for example, these uh, primary partitions, and we have backups of this data here and here. Uh, same stuff with these partitions, and this guy here as well. We add a new node. We start this process called migration, because this new node allows us to use more space. We need to rebalance our cluster the way that the resources can be used <coughs> more efficiently, and we don't have uh, highly saturated or less saturated now. So from this perspective, data now balanced, and we still have this idea of how this data is, is, is backup. So we see the, the stuff that we migrated to node T, uh, we actually have a backup of this data already on the other nodes. So um, this is how it was before, and this is how we migrated, right? So and plus, we also created some of the additional space that we can put more data here. Okay, how are we going to deal with the uh, decreasing size of the cluster? The node goes down for some reason. Like the angle fell the cluster. Like how awesome is that? Or how often do you see it in your data center, angle in data center? Okay, so the way how it works, the application uh, needs to read the data. Application needs to stay available. So that's why the first thing that the grid does, it restores the data from the backup. So the data uh, will be available for consumption immediately. And asynchronously, it started this process of uh, rebalancing cluster again, but uh, to uh, creating the backups of the missing data uh, and uh, make sure the data is still safe. Now, with this concept, it's actually it's a pretty powerful concept. In this concept, it actually scales very well from perspective of um, adding more nodes and going to you know hundreds of nodes. Uh, not only tens of nodes. So in terms of like hundreds of nodes, how are we going to scale Bruce Banner? So we would just clone him. So this is why it actually shows how we can uh, create bigger and bigger cluster, which is adding more and more nodes. Um, it creates some of the, uh, uh, some of the, like it's not the problems, but from perspective of developers, from perspective of uh, operations, from perspective of DevOps, it created some of the challenges. So for example, how to deal with the cluster of 1,000 nodes um, 
and why we can't put them on the same machine to, to better utilization of resources. Maybe we can use containers, but in this case we can utilize resources better. Um, maybe we can use something like uh, multi-tenant GVMs where we can run the same code in multiple GVMs, but we use some shared stuff, but multi-tenant GVMs, it's not something that everyone has, it's just, you know, some IBM research stuff, for example. Now, so there's a ways how this, um, commodity scalability, like a horizontal scalability can be also be solved. So when we, uh, the, the Bruce Banner can grow bigger, right? You can grow up to Hulk. So your machines, your computers, your, your commodity hardware can be replaced with bigger computers, with computers that really beefy, like, uh, like I mentioned, like hundreds of uh, uh, gigabytes of RAM or maybe terabytes of RAM. So that allows to use um, this memory uh, that outside of the, um, the outside of the reach of I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with the concept of garbage collect that we have in Java, but this concept actually uh, pretty painful for many developers because it uh, at some point uh, it, the people who design this virtual machine they are very smart they are working on optimization this garbage collection thing, but still in the very worst case scenario where they need to deal with lots of garbage it will end up with this. Uh, idea of the stop of the world. So it will stop all threads in the JVM to per per perform this garbage collection. So what this uh, will lead as a, as, a, as a user, user will see slowness application because application will start responding. To deal with this, so we, uh, we as a Hazelcast and the other tools, they, uh, other systems they use uh, for a similar concept, they actually remove the data from the heap and uh, uh, use all available physical memory. They kind of escaping from the sandbox and use all available memory to store effectively uh, uh, gigabytes of in gigabytes of data. Um, and in terms of queries, so in memory data, uh, in memory grid, your data is already there. So how we can you know deal with this uh, like possible system? Do we need them? Because they actually have the same similar stuff uh, as 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 uh, SQL databases where they can also write into the file system. Some of them have in-memory engines, but in general, like you're already storing your data. And one of the, uh, there's a company called uh, Zero Time Around, they run this like developer uh, survey a couple of years ago. They the name Hazelcast, one of the solutions that people use as a NoSQL storage. Not just a cache where your data is temporal, but they can trust to use these, uh, the in-memory grid system to be a uh, source of truth. Now, we want to go global, right? So we, we need to, how we can support these multiple data centers and stuff. Um, or how we can preserve data that's stored in one data center in another. So let's go global. With, uh, with the concept of the WAN application that two clusters can replicate each other across across the WAN. Because why we cannot spawn the cluster across the WAN? Because the latency, latency is too high that will not allow to perform grid very well. Remember that I showed you graph of the network speed? It's, it's good, but still on the wide uh, access uh, networks, we don't have the speed. We have the speed in dedicated data centers in our um, uh, the places where we build this. Uh, we build data centers, we build like fast networks, but uh, when we go into global, not always a uh, good, uh, good idea to spend a cluster on this one. But, um, so the, the, the different clusters can be deployed in the WAN range. So for example, some of the application um, can use another data center as DR. So um, we write data, session data, some of the caching data into one place, application goes down, and we can switch your, our application to another uh, disaster recovery system. Or it can be two ways. We have uh, two, um, uh, two places where we need to use this data and both applications they need to use this data. So they actively change this information, they actively change it, changing the data. So uh, the basically now you know some of the things about the memory data grids. Uh, I hope you learned something here today. Uh, I uh, have one minute of questions but I will hang out here so if you have some questions I will answer them. And I hopefully I don't see that kind of people here in the little group, so I'm waiting for your questions. And if you don't didn't have a chance to ask a question today, you can always find me on Twitter and ask a question there. Uh, or you can send me email. Uh, it's it's a Victor at Hazelcast if you don't have a Twitter. Thank you for your time.
presentations can be uploaded. Oh, it's one of them. Yes. So everybody, you know, you have it through the website when you log in and everything. You can download all the presentations that you've seen over the last two days, and you got the contact info there. So you get the record, 76 slides in 45 minutes, and, and not a hiccup, and but really great information. So I really appreciated that. Uh, a lot of it touched a, a couple of nerves on things I'm working on, so I can completely see uh, Hazelcast. Uh, what we've seen is it's continuing to grow in presence in the industry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with that, we're going to wrap up so you guys can head next door. Of course, Victor's going to be here if you have more questions, or you can follow up with them afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.